I have a question. Have you ever just not prepared for something and you got caught? You weren't ready. You ever been there? Maybe it was a test. You did not study for the test and you realized you didn't know anything that was on that exam and you just get that sick you know, feeling in your stomach. Or maybe it was something at work. Your boss had like asked you to do something. The deadline came and for whatever reason, you just kind of, oh, it's okay, I got this. And you realize, I don't got this. Have you been there before? Um, if you Maybe a piece of advice that you wish you would have taken and you thought, oh man, if I could just go back in time, I would go back and I would definitely listen to what that person was trying to tell me. Um, I think we've all been there. And that feeling of not being ready is called regret. That feeling of regret. Like, ah, oh, I just, if I could just go back, I would definitely change things. Um, I was thinking about times I've, I've not been prepared for something and, you know, kind of uh, feeling that sense of regret. Probably one of the worst examples of this in my life was on our honeymoon, okay? So here, this is the worst story ever, and I can't tell you the whole story today. Uh, yeah, typically you don't hear that, but that's true. Michelle, she was in charge of planning the wedding. I was in charge of planning the honeymoon. And my parents were so generous. They gifted us this uh, this week in Mexico. And so I booked the timeshare. I got all that planned. I was proud of myself. I booked the plane tickets. You know, we're all set up. We're all good. I'm 22. Michelle's 20. We're really young. I hardly ever been on a plane before. Uh, this is before 9-11. We were born in 19, 1999. So we go to the airport and we're ready to check in to go to this wonderful destination honeymoon. And we hand the bags. Actually, I hand my bag. Michelle's bag is lost already. It's another story. I'm telling you, it was terrible. Here's the point. I get there and they're asking for the passport. I'm like, for Mexico? Passport? Like, I've been in Mexico on mission trips like a lot of times, like we drove down there. And they don't, <laughs> you can go to Mexico. No one's keeping you out of Mexico. Just go on in, right? I, I don't have a passport. Michelle does not have a passport. Talk about regret. That is not how you want to start your marriage, right? I can't finish the story, but mm, if I wish I would have paid attention, right? That's it. You know, um, that is full of life. And you know, I, I, I've been on many mission trips since, and guess what's always packed in my bag now? I never leave home without my passport, right? You know, um, when you think about when you think about things, you wish you would have paid more attention. I wish I would have actually <laughs> asked the travel agent if I need a passport to go to Mexico. You know, all those things kind of factor into life. Um, today's our last sermon in our series in Henderson as it is in heaven, and we're really answering this question. The question has been really kind of laid for the entire series to this one, and that's really this: How does heaven come to earth? Really. How does it really come to earth? And I'm gonna give you the answer right up front. It comes by taking Jesus seriously. It comes by not blowing off what Jesus says. You know, you might blow off that, hey, you better study for your final. You might blow off that, you know, hey, you have that deadline at work. You better be ready for that, whatever. And you might suffer for that. But I'm telling you, friend, like this is one thing you do not wanna blow off. Christians are people that take Jesus seriously. I wanna, I wanna dive into that today because if we're gonna see heaven in Henderson, it's gonna come by a group of Jesus followers that are really taking him seriously. And I wanna, I wanna show you something, how he ends this famous Sermon on the Mount. This is just incredible today. It's in Matthew chapter seven. We, we got a little taste of it earlier. Look, look at how this ends. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now I have some bold terms that we're gonna loop back to in a minute. I'm not gonna talk about them now. Just note them as we read this. So not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I want you to notice evildoers there. 24, therefore, 
Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is a wise man. Everyone say the word wise man. Who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the wind blew and beat against that house. And yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Here's 26. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man. Everyone say foolish man. Foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain came down, the same rain, the same streams rose, the same wind blew. But this house fell with a great crash. Now guys, here's what's wild about this. That's the end of the sermon. Jesus knew how to drop the mic before anyone knew what a mic drop moment was. He ends it that way. You imagine that? That's how, I mean, you're hearing, you're on the edge of your seat for three chapters in Matthew. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, that's the Sermon on the Mount. And he just ends it. And the house crashed. Bam. It's left. Which are you? Are you the wise man who takes his words seriously? Are you the foolish man who disregards his words? Talk about regret. I want you to think about this. These are the final, these, this is the, the teaching of Jesus in the sermon. Now, I want to think about Matthew for a minute. So Matthew is, is kind of composing his gospel, his, his recollection of the life and ministry of Jesus. You know, this is written decades later. Matthew is stitching together, how will I present my biography of Jesus? And so it's really interesting. The first few chapters of Matthew, his a little backstory for his birth. He runs down to Egypt, you know, the whole Joseph scene. And there's a Herod scene. There's the John the Baptist part. He's baptized. He gets tempted in the desert, right? But right out of the gate, Matthew says, I want to front load the teachings of Jesus, so just a little preliminary stuff, but in chapter five, so early in the gospel, I want to put all of the teachings of Jesus in one concentrated place that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And this, this teaching is profound. It's revolutionary. At the end of the sermon, the people are just amazed because he doesn't teach like anyone else they've ever heard. He's got authority. And in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has summarized what his kingdom looks like. He blesses all the wrong people. He blesses the poor, the mourning. He, he, he blesses those that are persecuted. I mean, in this world, those aren't the blessed people. Those are the people that are like under the foot of the blessed people. The rich are the, are the ones that are blessed. And yet Jesus is almost kind of reversing things. He says his kingdom is gonna be kind of upside down and backward. And then he talks about how he has come to fulfill the law and the prophets and that his followers' righteousness will exceed that, those of the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And Jesus is teaching, it's about elevating the moral standards beyond anything we've ever seen before. It's not just what you're doing on the outside, it's who you are on the inside. He teaches about how to pray and how to give, how to fast, how to, how to, how to, how to live a life of true transformation, how it's not just committing adultery, it's the lust that leads to adultery. Jesus focuses on the, on the, on the, on the inner, inner man and he, and, he, and, he, and he stitches this all together. He teaches us the Lord's Prayer where we get our theme for our, fra our phrase in Henderson as it is in heaven in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. He's telling his disciples to pray into this way. Now pray that God's kingdom comes. He tells us where to put our treasures. He says, hey, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's gonna be. So lay up your treasures in heaven. Then he gets to the last part of this sermon where we just read. And he ends with three quick parables. Three quick parables about people who either take him seriously or don't. People who either, either listen to Jesus and they take him seriously or people who kind of disregard Jesus and kind of go on their way. Now, at the end of this parable, um, I think we rightly kind of scratch our heads a minute and say, okay, Jesus, that's hard. Like the servant, love your enemies? Like really? Uh, you know, do good to those who persecute you? How do we actually live this way, Jesus? How do we actually put this into practice? This is your vision for the kingdom. How, how does this happen? And I, I, and I think that what Matthew does is I think, 
um, he, he's going to answer that question, but it's going to be really interesting because, as I said, this mountain is on the front of the gospel. But there's another mountain teaching at the end of the gospel. And so it's almost as if Matthew has written his gospel in this literary pattern of two mountain teachings with this valley of all of the, the works of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus in between. But the two mountain teachings, the Mount of Olives uh, at, at the end and the, Mount, the, uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount in the beginning, they're, they're to be in dialogue with each other. In fact, there's some literary connections or hyperlinks between the two teachings that answer the question, how do you actually live this kingdom life out? How is it that you actually live out the Sermon on the Mount? And so what I want to do today is I want to look at this last teaching, the teaching on the other mountain, the Mount of Olives. And I want us to draw our attention there because this is after Jesus has lived, gathered his disciples, led the, the whole country into, into different like ex, expressions of the, of the messianic movement of Jesus. And now he's got this following and they're all leading to this like crescendo at Jerusalem. And they're all asking the same question. All the disciples are. And the question is, is when is the kingdom gonna come? We're convinced you're the Messiah. We've been under Rome's boot for, for centuries or, or other oppressors. And you're finally gonna deliver us. So when is this kingdom gonna happen? And you could feel it, the tension. They're excited, they're, you know, the, the triumphal entry of Jesus, right? The, 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 the king on the, on the donkey coming into the city. They're crying out, Hosanna. And so they're all asking this question and Jesus says, okay, it's time for my final teaching. The Sermon on the Mount of Olives. When is the sign of your coming? When will we see this kingdom? You know, it's really crazy. I, I actually went to Israel. I've told you this before. And I, I've been on the Mount of Olives. And it is, it is amazing. It's just adjacent to the old city of Jerusalem. So if you're in the old city, and a lot of you know the iconic, you know, Dome of the Rock, the Muslim, uh, uh, the mosque there. Across from that, there's this valley. And on the other hill is this Mount of Olives. And I remember when I got there, I was like a kid in a candy shop and I was like so excited. And I had a bunch of young adults with me and Michelle was there and Mel, Melanie, she was in the first uh, service. She was, she was there and I'm like, guys, we're on the Mount of Olives. This is like amazing. I'm like, I'm Disneyland. I'm like, let's, let's go, let's climb the Mount of Olives, you know? And it's, it's, it's actually a, a modern cemetery, actually. There's lots of, of, but there's this road that winds up and sure enough, you get into the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean, the garden, you guys, it was, isn't that amazing, right? The garden of Gethsemane, I was there, right? I'm like, I bet Jesus prayed around this olive tree. And one of these, some of these trees are 2000 years old. So I'm in Disneyland, you know, it's pastors Disneyland. So I'm running up the Mount of Olives and I look behind and the rest of them are like dying, you know, and I'm the oldest one there. I'm like, come on, you guys are young, let's go. You know, anyway, we climb to the top, but then I get this picture of Jesus teaching this parable in that location. Because from that location, you have a clear view of Jerusalem. And what Jerusalem doesn't realize is they're in for it because they're not gonna build their house on the rock. They're gonna build it on the sand. And Jesus sits down as the rabbis do, and he taught this parable. Look at it. Then the kingdom of heaven will look like 10 bridesmaids who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were, let's all say it, foolish. And five were, see the connection? He goes on, he says, the five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps. But the other five were wise enough to take, a extra, take along extra oil. And then we have verse five. Now, verse five, every one of Jesus's parables just about always have this unexpected twist in them. This is the part of the story where like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, this is just kind of his style of teaching. So he sets the scene with this kind of this wedding picture and this ancient wedding ceremony. And typically what would happen is that these, these, uh, these banquets would happen in the evening and there would be these torch lit kind of pathways that would lead you to the banquet. So, so far, so good. What's a little weird is you have these bridesmaids as the ones holding the torches. But okay, so let's imagine there's these 10 bridesmaids and they all have these torches and they're assigned to kind of lit the pathway that leads to the banquet for the wedding. 
But here's the twist. The twist is that the bridegroom was delayed. This wouldn't happen normally. Normally, you're not waiting hours and hours and hours. But what you'll find out in the story is that's what happens. This bridegroom doesn't show up for a long time. In fact, it says, as they waited, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. So now you have this kind of almost com- 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 can't say the word, comedic kind of look, right? Where you have like these girls falling asleep. Like this is kind of funny, right? Um, and it's, it's because it's late. Hours go by, you know? Their torches start to go out. They were already, you know, hours ago. I don't know what's happening into their makeup. I have no idea. But you know what I mean, right? They're just like, what's going on here? Why is the bridegroom delayed? What's also interesting about this story is there's no mention of the bride in this parable. Isn't that interesting? There's the bridesmaids, there's the groom, there's no mention of the bride. I think that's because the church is the bride. Different story, different sermon, but that's interesting. So at midnight, verse six, they were roused by the shout, look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. So in the middle of the night, we're gonna finally start this dinner. Again, weird, you don't normally do that, right? But look what happens, here's the next thing. All the bridegroom, all the bridesmaids got up and started to prepare their lamps. The five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough oil for all of us. Go to Walmart (laughs) and buy some. But it's after midnight. Walmart's not open, right? All right. This is this is the tension. Guys, this is the regret. You're going to see it right here. Remember the end of the Sermon on the Mount? Regret, the mic drop moment. Your your house was not built on the rock. It was built on sand and when that storm came, bam. You didn't take my word seriously. Here's the regret. So there's a stitching from this parable to that Sermon on the Mount. We've crossed the entire, you know, if there's two mountain peaks in Matthew, the entire valley would be all the teachings and doings of Jesus. But these two towering mountain peaks are what it all hinges on. These people weren't ready. These five bridesmaids weren't ready. Verse 10, it says this. It says, while they were gone to buy the oil, the bridegroom came. Those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was locked. Verse 11, later when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside. Notice this, Lord, Lord, there it is. Lord, Lord, open the door for us. Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out devils in your name and do all kinds of mighty works. Look at the next verse. Talk about this link. He called back and said, believe me, I never knew you. I do not know you. Matthew is connecting this. These five foolish bridesmaids are the foolish man that didn't build his house on the rock. They, he didn't take Jesus seriously. And then Jesus almost turns. He's like in this parable, and then he turns to his live audience, and he addresses them. So you, too, must keep watch, for you do not know the day of my return. The ready are the wise. You know, I want to say this, guys. Disciples don't get ready. They live ready. They live ready. You know, I think, I think we can kind of have this, maybe this strategy we try to play with God. And the strategy goes something like, I'll live life on my terms and I'll just try to get ready for when God comes or when I die, you know, as if I have that much control over life. But that is really just deceiving yourself. That is actually evidence that you're not a disciple of Jesus. Because disciples of Jesus don't try to play those kind of games with God. I've talked to people before and they've said, you know, hey, I'm just going to kind of live my own life. And, you know, when I get older, I'll, I'll, I'll get more serious about this whole God thing, you know? And, and you know, that, that I'll just kind of like, you know, I want to kind of sow my wild oats or whatever they say. I want to live my own life. I don't want to, you know, become a Christian right now because, you know, I want to have some fun, you know, as if that equals fun, right? But that's what the world's offering them. And I'll tell you something, you know, and I'll just get ready later. 
Guys, that's the foolish bridesmaids in the story. You hear me there? That's the foolish bridesmaids. Because true disciples, they don't get ready for Jesus. They are ready for Jesus. They're living ready for Jesus. This is gonna tie into how the kingdom comes in a minute. But I want you to get that clear in your minds. That's, that's the key. The key is, how am I actually living? Who am I actually really, right? That's the heartbeat of the Sermon on the Mount, right? Not praying on the street corner so people can hear your prayers or see your giving, you know? You know, that public ostentatious expressions of religion, you know? Look how much I'm giving. Jesus is like, I, I don't care about any of that stuff. I, I wanna know what, who are you really? What's flowing out of your heart when no one's looking? which is really fascinating with this story because there's an absence here, isn't there? The, the, the bridegroom, the groom is gone. He's absent. He's absent. You know, <clears throat> we're all waiting for something, aren't we? Every one of us are. Life is about waiting. I remember, you know, when I uh, was, when I was, in, I talked about my honeymoon. So obviously I'll start there. Man, I couldn't wait to get married. You guys have been there before? Like, ah, oh, just can't wait. And then when you get married, you just like, man, oh, after a while, like, I can't wait for kids, right? We even use that expression, I can't wait. Cause we're in that waiting period, you know? Then we have those kids and they're born and you're like, man, I cannot wait until they are potty trained. You guys have been there before? Man, I can't wait. For I was telling this in the first service. My wife, she read this book and it is like potty train your kid in one day. And, and she did it. She followed that thing to a T and she like, I don't know, some kind of magic wand. Those kids were potty trained in a day. It was crazy. It was like, wow, um, great are you. You know, that kind of thing. Wow, you know. But then, then they get to that, they, they, they get potty trained and then they get into their, their like school starts to flow. And then you're like, oh man, you know, um, I cannot wait until they're not in the house anymore. No, I'm just joking. Right? But you get that, right? You get this little scene, you know, and then, but, but really what happens, then you start thinking, oh, why was I such in a hurry back then? I would, Michelle says this all the time, I would just go back right now and start changing diapers. I love that stage, you know, in the, in the middle of it, you did it, right? And then you go into your own life and, and you, you get into your career, right? You finally get out of college. I can't wait to get out of college. You get into your career. Then you're just like, okay, I can't wait to get that promotion. I can't wait to buy that house. I can't wait to do this, this. And then, and then what is it, everybody? I can't wait to retire, right? Like that's what we are all waiting for. We're all waiting. Huh, what are you waiting for? Can, can I talk about this for a second? I think that what we wait for, we end up working for. I think whatever we wait for, we automatically work for. It's just part of being on earth. And none of these milestones are wrong. It's part of life. You want to work for that graduation or work for that next stage of life. But here's the distraction. Here's the problem. A disciple of Jesus is supposed to be waiting for something greater than the next milestone of life. There's supposed to be something that's life defining for us Something that corrects any time we get off a little bit, any time we start getting a little bit sideways. And what that is supposed to be is this anticipation for Jesus. This, I can't wait for Jesus. And see, that's the problem. When we aren't waiting for Jesus, we're not working for Jesus. Something else has our weight and therefore something else has our work. So what are you waiting for? The five closest people in your life know exactly what your life's about. They know, they know, because you talk about it without even realizing you talk about, oh man, when I'm retired, I cannot wait. I'm gonna be dead. You know, whatever has your weight has your work. Whatever has your attention has your focus, right? It's just, it lines up that way. And so I wanna ask you, are you someone who's waiting for Jesus? The, the next parable in this, there's three. Remember I told you there were three parables at the end of the Sermon on the Mount? There are three parables at the end of the Mount of Olives speech. I'm just gonna briefly touch on this, this second one. It's the parable of a master or, or a wealthy man who is gonna leave three servants behind. And each servant is gonna get a, a certain portion of money. The first servant gets five bags of gold, depending on how faithful he is. The second get, gets two bags of gold. And the final servant, he gets one bag of gold. Again, the master's away, there's a delay. And when he returns, he says, okay, tell me, how'd you do? And the one that had the five bags of gold, he says, I have 10 bags of gold for you. The master says, well done, 
you have been faithful. In a little, I will make you ruler over much, man. Wait till you see what I've got in store for you. I'm a little paraphrased there, but that's what he says. Second one, two bags of gold. What do you got for me? I got four. I doubled what you gave me. Same exact words. Well done. Wait till you see what I've got for you. Last one, one bag. What you got for me? Here's your bag back. That's the twist. You're expecting him to show up with two, but he doesn't. In fact, he shows up with one bag, and instead of being ashamed, he attacks the master. He says, I was afraid of you because I know you're a scoundrel. You take food that's not, that doesn't belong to you. You harvest other people's fields. You're, 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 you're hard, hard and, 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 and a very harsh owner. And at that point, the master looks at him and says, okay, so if I was so harsh, you should have at least put my money with the exchangers to get interest. But what you really are is you're a lazy and an, a wicked servant. And the master says, away from me into everlasting judgment. That's parable two. Element, same element. You have a master that's a gone. You had a groom that didn't show up on time. You have this delay. Let me tell you what happens with delays. Delays reveal who we really are, don't they? In these stories, the delay of the master kind of caused some distance to form. And it's in the distance. We even have that old nursery rhyme when the, you know, the, my, the cat's away, the mice play, you know, kind of deal. Like, who are you when there's no cat? Who are you when mom and dad aren't home, right? Who are you when the teacher walks out of the classroom? Who are you when the boss is, you know, out on vacation? I mean, those are the things, when the authority figure is gone, right, the real you shows up. These parables are to tease that out. Like, who are you really? when no one's looking. That's what Jesus is after in the Sermon on the Mount. That's what he's after. Remember, he said, you're gonna know them by their fruit. You're not gonna know them by their gift. You're gonna know them by their fruit. He says, look, you might have lots of gifts. You might be able to cast out demons. You might be able to prophesy. You might be a powerful preacher. Guys, it's not the gift, it's the fruit that reveals the disciple. You might have had an amazing experience where you feel like, man, God really used me. I've got all these, you know, I'm a great, you know, whatever it is, whatever gifts you might have. And we as a church, people, we can become so enamored with the gifted people. But that's really smoke and mirrors. Because, guys, Satan, he can mimic those gifts. Satan can gift people to do the miraculous right? Paul even talks about a, the angel, the, the, the evil one being like dressed up as an angel of light and his ministers as agents of that deception. And he's literally saying that. And Jesus says, these false prophets are like wolves in sheep's clothing. The actual fact of the matter is, who are you underneath the clothes? That's what Jesus is getting at. Final parable, chapter, last one. Matthew 25. And this is a parable and a teaching all together. It starts out as a teaching. Remember where Jesus is at, you guys. He's on the Mount of Olives. He's looking at Jerusalem. It's right there in front of him. And he brings us to this scene. It's a scene that has captured our imaginations. We sing about this. We imagine it. John wrote about it in the, in the, in the book of Revelation, this vision of the kingdom and the, and the throne of heaven. And he says this, when the son of man comes in his glory, when all of the angels are with him and then he sits upon his glorious throne, he then, he says, verse 33, he says, all the nations will be gathered into his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So there's this final judgment scene. This is the final crescendo. And he's going to separate sheep from goats. This is echoing the foolish and the wise from the Sermon on the Mount. He's doing this separation. And then he says, he, here's, here's what the text says. He, he, he will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, onto the sheep, he'll say, come, you who are blessed by my father. And to inherit a kingdom that's been prepared for you from the creation. He says, for I was hungry and you fed me. Now I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. 
I was naked and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. You've probably all heard this before. This is one of the most famous parables of Jesus. Notice this response. So this is what's said, guys. This is what's said at the judgment. Jesus is on a throne, no longer in disguise among the homeless and the hurting and the hungry and the naked. He's in his glory. And he just told these sheep that they had done this to him. Their response is awesome. Then the righteous, these righteous, these sheep, they, 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 they reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothes? When did we ever see you sick and visit you? Then the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Now, we've interpreted that text a lot of different ways. But I want to make one observation here. When the king addresses these righteous ones, he points out that they were doing it to him the whole time and they didn't know it. What does that mean? Remember the other two parables? There was this, there was this distance in the parable. The bridegrooms, what are they going to do when the bride when the groom isn't there? What are the bridesmaids going to do? When, well, they're going to have enough oil. If, if, if we're in for a long haul, we're ready, right? Well, what are you going to do if you're one of the faithful servants and you've been given the, the bag of money? You know, well, I'm going to work until he shows up. You know, I'm going to stay, stay at it. Yeah, here it is. The king returns. He looks at these sheep and he says, the whole time you were doing it to me. What does that mean? That means they weren't doing it aware that he was there. They weren't doing that to get his favor or to somehow make a deal or like, look how good I am. Like, bless me now. Like, it wasn't that kind of deal. They didn't know the king was there. They were doing it out of who they actually were. They were doing it out of the fruit of their life. They weren't like, oh, it's church time. I better put on my church face, you know, or it's, oh man, Pastor Brad is around or whoever. I better like, you know, whatever, clean it up. I don't know. Like all of this stuff that we can try to do, right? All the trappings that we can try to do, that, that all that stuff is wolves, sheep in wolves clothing kinds of stuff. Inwardly, you're really not that. And see, the righteous ones, the ones that actually are the righteous ones, have been so transformed by the gospel and so formed by Jesus' teaching that if Jesus is there or not, that's who they are. When they see the sick, they go visit them and help them. When they see the poor, they try to reach out and help them. Guys, this is how the kingdom of heaven comes to earth. When God's people are just so formed by the gospel that no matter where they are, they just are like we talked about a couple weeks ago, gospel yeasts, just living out the gospel, just caring for the poor, caring for the people in their oikos, their little circle of friends. How can I show up and just be there? Not so that anyone sees me. It's not about being seen. I'm not praying on the street corner to be seen. I'm praying in my closet when no one sees. Do you guys catch this? This is the ed evidence. It's the fruit, not the gift. It's what's happening out of your life. And then he turns to the wicked. And he says, I tell you, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you're refusing to help me. Notice this. This is how he ends. And they will go away into eternal punishment and the righteous into eternal life. Mic drop. Both of these sermons end almost the same way with this like, what are you going to do? Mic drop moment. You can't, you can't say I didn't warn you. You can't say you didn't know. Guys, I don't know where all of us are with Jesus. But I know where Jesus is with Jesus. And when it comes to Jesus, Jesus was pretty sure you better take him seriously. You know, we can tend to like, I don't know if I need to take Jesus seriously, you know. I, I don't know. I'm going to tell you something, friends. Guys, Jesus has changed this world, whether you know it or not or realize it or not. People have been giving their life to King Jesus and the gospel has been growing in this dark world ever since he left. 
And if you need any evidence that there's something to this Jesus of Nazareth guy, just take a look at the world and say, wow, in the secret corners of the earth, there have been faithful followers of Jesus that no one knows that have been washing feet and starting hospitals and looking at the, the brokenness and looking at the, the hurting of the world and stepping in with no fanfare, no one even realizing they're doing it. And the gospel's coming, the kingdom is coming. I wanna to talk to you as I end today about a podcast I heard this week. It was an interview with Scott Hans Harrison from um, Charity Water. Scott Harrison grew up in a Christian home, but about 18, he kind of walked away from his faith. He hit his, he said his rebellious years when he was 18. He grew his hair out, joined a band, you know, started doing all kinds of stuff. And his band went nowhere. And he was, I think, playing clubs in New York or something. And he realized that the only people that make money are the promoters. And so he wasn't dumb. He's like, I'm going to become a promoter. So he becomes a nightclub promoter. And for 10 years, Harrison just is, he grows to become one of the most wealthy and successful nightclub promoters in, 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 uh, in Manhattan. In fact, the interview was about how, what kind of strategies he used to attract people to his nightclubs. Well, um, his mom has a really debilitating disease. His dad um, sends him a book. And he hits rock bottom about 10, year, 10 years into it. Even though he's making tons of money, he's blowing all of his money. Um, not to go into his whole story, but his dad sends him a book by A.W. Tozer, and it was called The Pursuit of God. And this book starts to just mess with him because he was raised in the church. He goes on one of these, uh, I think, these mercy ships that like help um, uh, you know, distressed countries. And he's staying on this boat. He's just kind of like, I need to find myself. I've lost myself. And he's off, off the coast of Liberia in Africa. And they're treating these, these people. And he realizes the water is the problem. Like they don't have water, access to clean water, any water at all. And, and he says, I think I, I'm supposed to do something about that. He goes back to his, his friends in Manhattan. And he says, hey guys, I wanna do a club show or whatever, but I'm gonna charge money to get in, the cover charge is gonna to go to this well drilling operation. And that was the start of what now is the most successful water charity in the world. In Jesus' name, Scott Harrison is bringing water to the world. I think he realized he wasn't waiting well for Jesus, promoting the nightclubs. There was something bigger he was being called to. He wasn't going to be one of those foolish bridesmaids caught without the oil when the king comes. He was going to build his house on the rock, changed the way he lived. His weight changed his work. What if, what if this church said, you know what? We're going to take Jesus seriously together. What if we said, you know, even if no one ever notices, no one ever sees it, I'm going to, in Jesus' name, start to just commit my life to waiting well. Look at this really interesting verse. I'm going to end with this. 1 Corinthians 2. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. In that parable, we're the faithful managers are welcomed in. I have to imagine he's got a smile. Wait till you see what I've got for you. Guys, what if every work done in Jesus' name out of a transformed heart are like the building blocks from which new creation is one day built? What if we can't even imagine how these little acts that seem so insignificant. These little things we do that, that, that happen here that are not forgotten are then taken and somehow like used in this new kingdom creation. What if, what if there's not any way we'd ever regret any sacrifice made for Jesus? I think he's that kind of God. Anyone else agree with that? I think he's the kind of God who just says, man, you were so faithful while I was gone. Wait till you see what I've got for you. Guys, here's the thing. As a church, we do this on two levels. 
We do this as individual disciples who all know our people that God's placed in our life. And we live this gospel life out. We just live it out. It was great. Right before church, we all gathered at the 820 gathering to pray. And I want to encourage you, if you can, come and pray with us. I know you're praying. They have, we have two prayer services, a little rabbit trail. Please come and pray with us. Okay. At this 820 prayer, Chris says, hey, does anyone have any stories before we pray? And we start sharing one. Chris shares a story. <laughs> Chris is crazy. He, he's like, I was out last night and there was a couple and they were fighting. They were fighting. And it was kind of tense and awkward because it was out in public. And the things the guy was saying to the wife was terrible. And so we left and I just felt like the spirit tapped me to go talk to him. I'm like, how do I talk to these people? They're fighting, they're mid fight. You know, how do I do that? And he goes, I started turning around. It's like, okay, Lord. And the homeless guy comes up to me. So like this story gets really crazy. Do you know whose keys these are? And Chris says, well, I'll try to find out. But it was the perfect way to interrupt their fight. Is this your keys? That leads to an awesome opportunity for Chris to eventually, and Alexis both pray with them, right? How awesome is that? Then Jeremy tells a story about a group of people in our church through this crazy, almost, it was an accident, comes and are able to help someone in our church that needed some help with their, their housing. And the beautiful way that God put a happy accident in the whole story where Jeremy's able to talk to this man and he just felt like God was leading him to do that. Then I was able to share a story of this job I was doing the other week and I was had this beautiful opportunity to share the gospel with these people that I did this, this, work, this job for. And it was just, that story is amazing because I come to find out there's like four other connection points. And I just like, I cannot wait to see what God does in that family. I just know God's drawing. Guys, that's just being gospel yeast. Just you saying, God, I'm here. And just however, like I'm, if I see that in front of me, I'm sensitive to the spirit, I'm gonna lean in. And then there's all of us together, church. Together. Us rolling up our sleeves corporately. What, what does our city need? What are, the, what are the hurting pain points in the city? Who are the naked? Who are the, who are the houseless? Who are the hurting? Who are the people in our town? How can we help the police department? How can we help these other agencies? How can we come into the city collectively? Guys, I have this dream that within three years, we'll have a recovery ministry for our city coming out of our church, where our church is engaged in hurting, helping the hurting people go through a 12-step discipleship-based, biblically-based process to meet and follow Jesus out of their addiction. Wouldn't that be amazing for the city of Henderson? Wouldn't that be amazing? What if we had, what if we had Alpha on the, on the campus of, of the Nevada State College? What if we had that happen? What if we had an Alpha actually on their campus where college students, guys, what if we just drew a line around this area of town and say, this is our responsibility. We are, this is us. This is where we live. This is our Babylon. We're going to bloom in Babylon. We're going to plant gardens here. We're going to build houses here. That's bringing heaven to Henderson. That's what it is. Man, I want to pray over you. And I want to give you that opportunity. We're going to remember the Lord in communion right now. And this will be a beautiful way for us to anticipate his return. Father, would you work in our hearts? If something else has our weight right now. If our eyes are focused on something that's really not supposed to grab our hearts, that we've let it grab our hearts, would you help us to repent of that? Would you re refocus us on to what we're supposed to really be waiting for? And that's the return of our King. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? And if you haven't got a communion element, would you do that now? Before we take communion, um, 
I want to, if you're a follower of Jesus, I want you just to take a moment and center your heart. Maybe close your eyes and just have a moment with Jesus and bow your heads. I want to, I want to speak to anyone in the room that might not follow Jesus yet. And I want to speak to you just really boldly, lovingly. And I want to ask you this question. Have you ever taken Jesus seriously? Don't build your life on the sand. There is something to this Jesus guy. He made claims that were either true or false. He either is who he claimed to be or he's not. His death on the cross either does break the curse of sin and the penalty of it, or it doesn't. As Paul says, if Jesus doesn't, then we have no hope. I'm so glad he does. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted in Jesus, you've never taken him seriously, I wanna invite you right where you stand to humble yourself before Jesus. And right where you stand, you can just pray this prayer out to God. And the prayer just says something like this, oh God, I do know I've sinned against you. I admit that. And I want you to save me. Turn me back to you. I put my trust and my hope in Jesus. I believe he died for me on the cross and I do believe he came back to life. Please, Jesus, save me. Come into my life. I make you my king from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. If if I could just have the whole church just kind of pray for a minute. If you made that decision though, if you said, yes, today I'm making Jesus my king, for the first time. I want you to raise your hand up so I can see that. Has anybody made that decision today? Anybody at all? Just raise your hand up high so I can see it. Anybody make that decision today to trust Jesus? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't yet. If you haven't ever been baptized, we are baptizing people in the next uh, week, next, next week. And I'd like you to sign up for baptism if you've never trusted Jesus and you're ready to give your life to him. Church, I wanna... I uh, invite you to uh, take the bread <clears throat> and I want to read this text of scripture as we end today. <clears throat> and here's what it says. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Though the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And notice this. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Does anyone know how this passage ends? Until he comes. We're taking communion, remembering him until he returns. This is, this is the bride waiting for his groom. This is us saying, Jesus, come. Until you come, we take this bread and we remember what you've done. And so let's do that. Let's hold the bread together and let's pray. Father, we know that you sent your son, the bread of heaven. He breaks the power of sin over us. His body was broken, but so was the curse. And we thank you for sending your son to be our savior. We trust you. We give our allegiance to you, King Jesus. And we remember this sacrifice today. In Jesus' name, let's take the bread. And now the cup. The blood of Jesus. Just really let that sink in, guys. The blood of Jesus shed for you. Oh, Father, there's no greater sacrifice that could have ever been made than the one that was made for us. Your very life, Jesus, poured out. We are forever thankful. In Jesus' name, we take the cup. If you need prayer, if you want to talk to one of the pastors, we'll be right up here after church. I love you, church.
Thank you so much. Like Brad said, if you need prayer or have questions, come see one of the pastors up here or come visit us in the Connection Hub. I have two invitations for you tonight, 520. If you could meet us at the new property, we're going to pray over the property. We'd love to see you all there. Another invitation we'd like to invite you into is if you haven't noticed, we are in a school and it needs to become a school this afternoon. So if you're able to stay, please meet us in the Connection Hub at 1230 because we got to switch classrooms and switch the room and we would just love your help. Church, thank you so much for being here and we will see you next Sunday.